Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Carl Atkinson. I'm a partner in Gunnar Cook. I'd like you, I'd like to welcome you all to the Gunnar Cook People Hour webinar that I'll be running this afternoon, in which I'll be examining the impact of the General Data Protection Regulation on human resources practice in 2018. You may be aware that this is one of a series of webinars which Gunnar Cook run uh, for people interested in human resources and employment law issues. And I hope that uh, you'll find the presentation helpful and informative. The aim of the webinar today is to examine the general, prote general data protection regulation and consider how it's likely to impact on the way that many of us undertake our roles within human resources or employment law uh, in whatever context that may be inside organizations as advisors uh, however however whatever shape that takes Many of you will have heard of the General Data Protection Regulation. It's received quite a lot of um, high profile press over recent months. It's uh, slightly ironic to my mind that uh, I've been involved in data protection work for about 10 years and it seems to have gone from being incredibly unfashionable um, for most of that time to suddenly becoming quite high profile over the past uh, past six months or so, uh, I suspect that that's probably driven by much of the negative marketing press, which has fixated upon the increase in the potential fines tariff that will be available to the Information Commissioner's Office, the UK regulator of data protection, under the new GDPR regime. Uh, many of you will be aware that the new potential tariff uh, for fines rises up to uh, 20 million euro or 4% of gross global turnover of the business in the preceding financial year. Um, clearly that's attracting a lot of headlines, a lot of interest and has resulted I think in um, some fairly indifferent uh, marketing messages creeping out there you know, into the marketplace. And um, I think that rather than being panicked into any kind of knee-jerk response in, in trying to address your GDPR issues, uh, and particularly falling into the trap of believing that there is some form of silver bullet solution to the GDPR problem, uh, it's far preferable for most organizations to look at the situation in a more holistic uh, manner and try to obtain the best possible understanding of what their obligations will be under the new legislation with a view to de-risking their position. My own view is that it's unlikely um, that the regulatory approach of the Information Commissioner in the UK will suddenly change when the GDPR comes into force on the 25th of May and move from being a relatively, um, if not benign, certainly not a uh, aggressive level of, uh, of regulation and become something quite different under the new regime. I don't really see that happening and in fact that message has been um, provided by the Information Commissioner herself, Elizabeth Denman, in one of her recent blogs in which she said that there wouldn't be a change in regulatory approach. So I don't subscribe to this view that's being um, disseminated by perhaps less well-informed or, or, or more sales-driven commentators who are suggesting that there is a, going to be a significant alteration to the regulatory approach of the ICO and as a consequence of that businesses should um, make um, quite uh, short-term uh, instinctive decisions about how they're going to comply with the legislation 
I don't think that will that will take place, and I think that businesses are far better advised to uh, look at the situation more holistically and, and plan for compliance in a more practical and uh, sustainable way. Uh, I think it's also important to emphasise at this point that compliance with the GDPR is not a snapshot issue that is relevant on the implementation date of the 25th of May and is not relevant after that. It's clearly an ongoing obligation and businesses should aim to be compliant on the 25th of May and, and thereafter. So it's clearly going to be a situation where compliance is going to need continuing resource, continuing effort, continuing thought on the part of businesses. And given all of that, my feeling is that it is far better to try and take a, a more informed holistic approach rather than look for some kind of solution in a box. Um, and what I wanted to do in this seminar is to look at some particular areas of human resources practice in the context of how I think they'll be impacted by the GDPR uh, and hopefully we'll be able to use those as examples of the, the type of effect that GDPR will have on human resources practice and you'll be able to use that information to inform your own thinking about your own practices within your own organisations and have a better understanding of how your approach or the organisation of your approach or your clients might need to change to um, accommodate the GDPR and ensure that the, there is maximum chance of greatest level of compliance. So as we go through, I'm going to identify these key areas, give an explanation of how GDPR will impact them in my view, uh, and hopefully that will allow you to inform your own thinking about the wider uh, impact and relevance of GDPR on your organisation. I have been asked on many, many occasions recently, over recent months, uh, by people uh, to explain what the general Pro data protection regulation is. And um, I think that time and again, I find myself coming back to uh, the outline explanation that it is <clears throat> a large scale major change to the data protection regime in the well, not just in the UK, uh, particularly for us in the UK, but in fact, it's worth bearing in mind that this is a Europe-wide um, change to legislation. And that's significant because um, when I was having these type of conversations going back a year of 18 months, um, people kept mentioning Brexit to me, but we're now at a situation now where the Data Protection Bill, which implements GDPR, is presently before Parliament, uh, and will be in force prior to the 25th of May. And clearly, uh, you know, any issues about Brexit are not relevant because GDPR will be in force in the UK before uh, we leave uh, the European Union. So that issue about Brexit has fallen away. The other thing that uh, quite a few people have said to me recently um, is that they've suggested that GDPR is the new millennium bug and that it's something that is being spoken about very widely in the context of um, it being a potential major problem for businesses. Uh, I had one client, director of a client, suggest to me last week that he thought, in fact, it was all going to be something and nothing, um, and that it, it wouldn't be of any significance, and, and uh, we'd all look foolish after the event. And I, I can understand where that kind of thinking comes from, but. What I said to him and what I said to other people that have raised the same argument is that the difference between GDPR and the Millennium Bug is that the GDPR exists to protect and promote the rights of um, individual people, data subjects, as I'll be calling them, and their rights and their interest in protecting their personal privacy is not going to go away. That's not something that, that's the crucial difference between GDPR and the Millennium Book. The reality of this is that people are increasingly aware of the value and importance of their personal 
privacy and they're also increasingly aware of the value of their data to organizations and in that context i think we have to anticipate that individual people will become more concerned about the way that organizations treat their data going forward and, and that's likely to result in pressure from data subjects to uh, comply with the relevant legislation so i don't see this as being something that can simply be ignored uh, i think the risk is too significant and the potential exposure if only on paper in relation to regulatory pen penalty is far too high profile. So it's legislation that's designed to align uh, the approach towards data protection across Europe. And it's also been described as the death of consent as a basis for processing of personal data. And this is something that I'm going to talk about in a certain amount of detail in the context of employment work and human resources practice because it's quite an important issue but just to come back to a point that i wanted to make about um, the impact of a gdpr across europe um, it's going to be enacted um, by the european member states and it relates to the rights of european citizens and it's important to bear in mind that organizations are going to be caught regardless of where they are located if they are processing data which relates to data subjects who are european citizens so this will mean that uh, for example sub data processing subcontractors possibly in india or, or outside of europe um, will be caught by the gdpr um, I re was recently consulted by a American business located in the States that was developing um, a, or selling a particular type of software to customers worldwide, but certainly in Europe, and uh, was processing their customers' data in the course of those transactions. And of course, for the first time, they will be caught by European data protection legislation. So. It's important to understand that the impact of GDPR is not simply com confined to the European Union, it's wider than that. And additionally, because GDPR imposes processing obligations uh, upon controllers, a data controller under the legislation will now be required to have processing um, agreements in place with their data processors. Uh, and there are um, provisions as to the clauses that will go into those data processing agreements. Essentially, data controllers will be required to ensure that the level of protection that's imposed upon them by the GDPR flows down the contractual chain to their processors. This will mean that for those processors outside the EU, they will be caught within the commercial agreements between them and the data controllers and i think what we will see as a consequence of this is that the impact of gdpr will go far beyond europe and in fact what i think we will see is it will become a new gold standard for data protection uh, worldwide i've certainly already advised a client that had licensees for their operating model and their brand worldwide that um, on the impact of GDPR on their organization and ultimately they reached the conclusion that it wasn't practical for them to have a higher level of data protection um, provisions in Europe than they operated in Tel Aviv or in Sydney or wherever else they had an operation and they decided that they were there, therefore going to scale up effectively all of their um, all of their business operations worldwide were going to implement GDPR standards of data protection. So I think we'll find that it will become in default a worldwide gold standard. So it has huge impacts for all businesses um, in the UK. In, in a couple of different ways, actually, in respect of uh, 
personal data, data relating to individual people that businesses have in the course of their um, employment relationship with data, data subjects and employees. And also, it's going to have a huge impact for data, personal data, which is held by organizations for marketing. I'm not going to talk too much about the marketing um, during the course of this presentation. I'm going to focus on personal data, which relates to the employment relationship. The reason why it's been necessary to implement the GDPR is because the existing data protection regime in Europe and in UK, that's the Data Protection Act 1998 is the present regime that we have, is, um, while it's not, um, I suppose it is old, 20 years old, but in the context of the technological change that's taken place in the past 20 years, the existing regime is simply uh, overwhelmed, it's simply not relevant to the, um, the way in which data is now used. Uh, many of you or some of you may have heard me speak in the past or might have seen my publications on social media in the workplace and uh, I've set out there my views on the threat that is um, provided to or the temptation perhaps that's provided to employees by virtue of the technology that's available widely available now in smartphones and the fact that many people, if not most people, now carry sufficient technology with them every day to allow them to post um, a public comment on a public forum within seconds of that thought occurring to them. And uh, the fact that so many, of, so many people do that on such a regular basis. And I think the existing data protection regime really doesn't reflect the way in which personal data has become so much more portable, transferable, and also valuable to businesses. The value of personal data um, for marketing purposes, for sophisticated um, marketeers is really very, very significant indeed. Um, in fact, you'll appreciate it underpins um, free or you know, free in inverted comments services such as Facebook, um, the fact that um, the algorithm that uh, is used by Facebook is able to identify uh, websites that you visited, things that you've shown, themes that you've shown interest in, and use that to target marketing towards you, which is more relevant um, to your interests and aspirations than might otherwise be the case it is something that would not have been conceived uh, a few years ago. So the present regime is not fit for purpose anymore. That has uh, pr promoted the need for change. What GDPR does is it introduces that change in a way which is going to be consistent across Europe and to a greater extent, uh, I think, inevitably worldwide. In order to understand the impact of GDPR, I think we've got to start from uh, the basis of having a uh, some understanding or, or some um, reinforcement or, or recognition of some of the key um, issues that arise under the present data protection regime. These are carried over largely into the GDPR. So it's important, I think, to go back to these as a foundation to our understanding of the impact of GDPR on human resources practice. What the Data Protection Act says is that processing of personal data will be legal in circumstances where uh, at least one of the processing conditions in Schedule 2 of the Act is met, and in the case of sensitive personal data, further conditions are also met. So where we are now is that in order to legally process personal data, 
it's necessary for an organization to rely upon at least one, could be more than one, but at least one uh, processing condition as defined by Schedule 2 of the Data Protection Act. And these are the processing conditions that are set out on this slide. One of the processing conditions which is probably relied upon many more times than all of the others, probably all of the others put together, is consent from the data subject. In fact, what's happened really in simple terms, the way that commercial practice or business practice has developed since the Data Protection Act of 1998 is that organizations have defaulted to the position that it's the easiest way to address processing of personal data is to get consent from the data subject to undertake that processing. It's relatively straightforward to get, or it's, I should say, it has been relatively straightforward to get that type of consent because the definition of consent which was set out in the Data Protection Act was fairly wide-ranging and crucially um, included the potential to imply the consent of the data subject to undertake processing in particular circumstances and that is going to change under the GDPR and that's a very significant change for all organizations particularly in relation to marketing but certainly in relation to the employment relationship and I'm going to discuss that in a moment but before we go on to look at that what I just wanted to emphasize at this point um, and I want to emphasize this because I think people are so preoccupied with the idea that uh, they obtain consent in order to undertake data processing that people often lose sight of the fact that there are other processing conditions which are available to businesses and organizations to um, allow them to lawfully undertake processing of personal data and particularly um, I would like to draw your attention to this um, second and third conditions which are outlined on this slide uh, the second of which is that uh, processing of personal data would be um, in compliance with the data protection act where the processing was in performance of a contract to which the data subject was a party i think that's very relevant because i see that as being um, the case in the employer employee contractual relationship so i'm going to go on and argue that businesses may want to consider this second processing condition as being the basis to undertake the processing of personal data which forms part of the employment relationship and alternatively um, alternatively in the sense that this could apply to circumstances prior to the creation of an employment employment contract so possibly in the course of recruitment the taking of steps at the request of a data subject in order to enter a contract would be a lawful processing condition and i'm going to talk about whether receiving uh, cvs and um, job applications from um, applicants job candidates in uh, in the recruitment process would fall within that processing condition further in later in the presentation as well so please bear in mind that there is a list albeit that some of these processing conditions are inevitably more relevant to the employment relationship than others but don't fall into this trap of assuming that the only relevant processing condition will be consent because that's not correct i think that at the outset of any consideration of um, the compliance of an organization under data protection regime it's really important to understand what is meant by personal data 
sometimes businesses make a mistake um, and assume that personal data in some way correlates to confidential data and then they fall into this trap of beginning to assume that it's all really about sort of commercially confidential information and it's not that at all. Personal data is information that relates to a living individual uh, and in some way uh, identifies that individual. Um, a leading case on this is this case that I've identified in the slide of it Itty Hadier uh, and Chain Gardens. And um, what is established there is that um, it sets out this provision that uh, personal data has to, um, in order to fall within the relevant definition, it has to identify a living individual. And it's also suggested that it's not sufficient um, and a name, an individual's name, would not be sufficient to fall uh, into the category of personal data. And so many people often ask me about business cards, and I think based upon that suggestion in that case, I think we can safely exclude business cards from category of personal data. But you can see that um, this, this kind of information um, may include clearly names, addresses, could include a job title of an individual where there's only one person in an organization that has that job title. Um, some organizations I've seen retain passport um, numbers for their employees. Um, I think that may be more relevant in circumstances where they're arranging international business travel on a regular basis. That would certainly fall within the definition of personal data. Uh, photographs would do. Um, there's a suggestion that now the GDPR will include biometric data, which is interesting. Uh, most people I've spoken to about biometric data have dismissed it. And, and in fact, I'd not considered that it was particularly relevant for most organizations until I spoke to a client recently who was telling me that they'd rolled out in his business um, uh, a, a, a program of issuing people with corporate iPhones. And of course, if you're familiar with that technology and the, the equivalent Samsung product, you'll know that it operates on the basis of um, scanning either a fingerprint or facial recognition which of course is biometric data. Um, and so there'd be a whole issue there uh, in relation to biometric data for any organization that's operating corporate uh, phones with that kind of technology. So don't just assume that because you don't have some kind of scanning system on the doors into your office, that that's um, not biometric data, is not a relevant consideration for your organization. Because what's clear to me after speaking to quite a few people about this is that more and more organizations are acquiring data in ways that um, were not anticipated and were not designed, I guess. Uh, and as a consequence of that, they do have this odd situation that they're not really 100% certain about the full nature of all of the personal data that they hold uh, and what exactly they're doing with it. Processing of personal data is, is quite a wide definition and really um, amounts to doing anything of any significance with it. So, you know, if you are using it um, in order to create other reports or as a basis for decision making or um, in, a, in a filing, an organized filing system, all of that would be processing. It's extremely difficult for me to envisage a situation where an organization would hold personal data on employees and not process it. Uh, although I did speak to a client last week who was suggesting to me that they had a lot of uh, old data on former employees that was just uh, in a load of cardboard boxes slung in an attic room somewhere in no kind of filing system and in no recognizable order uh, and they were suggesting that they thought that that would not be processing and i can kind of see that argument because it wasn't in a filing system but equally i, I think that the information commissioner would certainly just say to them in those circumstances well if that's how you are retaining it why on earth have you got it? You know, there's no justifiable reason for 
having that kind of information and, and you've really got to get rid of it. So I don't, uh, I haven't really come across any, any businesses um, that I can recall who have um, retained personal data on employees and not processed it. Remember that I just, in respect to the sli last slide, emphasize the importance of understanding the processing condition that you rely upon to process personal data. In almost all cases, um, I would expect most of you who are listening to, to this will find that the processing, the relevant processing condition for either your organization or your clients will be the consent of the data subject stroke employee. And I would expect that that is obtained at either some preliminary stage in the employment relationship where they sign a contract, an employment contract, there may be a clause in the employment contract that talks about consent to data, data processing, or indeed, at a more sophisticated level, your organization might have, for example, an employee privacy statement that would say, um, to the employee, this is what we're going to do with your personal data, we're going to use it for these things. Very often um, I've seen employee privacy statements which have been drafted to comply with the existing regime, i.e. not the GDPR, um, which effectively simply say we're going to use your personal data um, however we see fit um, for as long as we see fit and uh, you, know, you're, you are deemed to, to consent. That kind of approach certainly won't be compliant with the GDPR um, and any business that um, continues to rely upon consent obtained in that way is going to find very quickly that they're not compliant with the new legislation. So I think we need, and that leads us on to an examination of uh, this issue of consent. It's going to be it's hugely important in relation to marketing, but it's also going to be very important in respect to the employment relationship because, as I've explained, I think con consent will be the processing condition that most businesses rely upon as a basis to process personal data. That's fine. Consent still exists in theory under the GDPR. However, what the new legislation does is change the definition of consent for the purpose of the legislation and it tightens it up uh, very significantly indeed and as a consequence of this uh, and some of the other provisions about particularly withdrawal of consent uh, you can understand why uh, i made this comment at the start of the uh, presentation that gdpr may be the death of consent as a processing condition for lots of um, businesses, uh, really because consent is going to be much less attractive to businesses as a basis for processing under the GDPR. That's the headline. Uh, if we look at the detail of this, the relevant provision is Article 411 of the GDPR, which sets out the definition of consent. And there are a couple of important points to pick out of this. And these are that in order to be compliant with GDPR, consent has to be freely given, informed, unambiguous, um, and clear about the data subject's wishes. And this suggests to me that it needs to be um, distinguishable. I think that the way that this will be interpreted um, will be that it will not be possible for a data subject to give a blanket consent to uh, an employer to do whatever they like with the data subject's data. I think that what would be more likely to be compliant, and I wouldn't even, I wouldn't suggest that this will be definitely compliant, I think it's more likely to be compliant, would be some form of consent document where the organisation breaks down all the different processing 
activities and the employee or data subject consents to the use of their data in, in respect to those individually. And that's because Article 411 talks about consent being specific, not general. <clears throat> so that's one issue. Um, it has to be based, um, it has to be gained in circumstances where the data subject is informed as to the processing activity and it has to be given in a way which is unambiguous. These two terms are significant because they are going to mean that it will no longer be legally valid to argue that consent can be implied based upon the behaviour of a data subject. So many of you will have seen employment contracts that say uh, something along the lines of um, we're going to use your uh, personal data to do stuff that's relevant to our business and um, yeah, if we don't hear from you to the contrary we'll assume you're okay with that. That's implied consent. That is definitely not informed and unambiguous consent. So that kind of approach will not be um, compliant under the GDPR. I can give you another interesting example of this that many of you, uh, particularly with uh, teenage kids, will be familiar. Um, and that is uh, in, where you have gone into a pub or restaurant which has advertised that there is a, quote, free Wi-Fi, unquote, available uh, to you and all that is required for you to access that free Wi-Fi is for you to supply them with your name and email address and of course you provide the name and email address in order to access the free service and in fact your name and email address is automatically ad added to the marketing database of the pub or restaurant uh, that's, uh, that you visited. Um, and clearly what's going on there is that the organization is implying your consent to use your data, your personal data, to be added to their marketing database. And um, that approach will not be uh, compliant under the GDPR. Interestingly, I think it was Weatherspoons, um, a pub chain uh, you may be familiar with, uh, before Christmas uh, unilaterally announced that they were going to abandon their marketing, their email marketing database. And they spanned that in a very positive way that suggested that they were mindful of the importance that their customers attached to their personal privacy. Uh, and they neglected to mention that they, in reality, would be forced to abandon the marketing email database as a consequence of GDPR in May in any event. So classic example there, uh, and it, it, it may not be where the spins I thought it was, but I'm not 100% sure about that. A classic example of, an, uh, of a business turning a negative into a marketing positive. So what, what we are seeing there is that implied consent will no longer be uh, viable for a business. It has to be specific, has to be informed. And you'll also see that under um, um, Article 2, it should be specific and distinguishable, you know, which is um, also another basis for my point that, it, that one size fits all generic consent won't be um, sufficient. Um, and also, significantly under Article 7.3, the data subject will have the right to withdraw or revoke consent. This is, an, uh, this will be a, this is a unilateral right. This is not something that the employee stroke data subject has to provide notice of in advance of them doing it. They can simply do this at, a, at the drop of a hat. And you can imagine that that potentially creates significant problems for an employer as well. Um, so what you can appreciate from all of that is that there are very significant impacts for uh, almost all businesses. I, can't, I haven't seen a business that's not going to be uh, significantly impacted in the context of the employment relationship by GDPR around this issue of consent.
Um, and what I think businesses will need to do is to reflect and understand the extent to which they rely upon consent as a basis for the processing that they presently undertake and then try to work out um, whether they will continue to rely on consent after 25th of May and GDPR coming into effect or whether they want to try and approach this in a different way. Casting your mind back to the slide where I referred to the alternative options uh, as processing conditions under the um, Data Protection Act uh, and the possibility that for the employment relationship you may be able to rely upon compliance with the contract to which the data subject is a party as a basis for um, processing. So I would be, rec well I am recommending to business clients that they undertake that analysis of the extent to which they rely upon consent as a basis for processing and um, once they've done that they consider whether they wish to do so continue that reliance going forward after May. If the answer to that is yes and I think that many businesses will just take the view that it's easier to carry on relying upon um, processing conditions that they're familiar with in, in outline. I think that uh, businesses will be required to um, draft, adopt, put in place new, far more specific, far more detailed employee privacy statements. And where I've been advised, where I've been asked to advise on these already, what I've been saying to people is that I think these really have to address all of the different processing activities that the organization will carry out in respect of the personal data of the employee or data subject. So that might be your payroll function, it might be the emergency contact details of next of kin, it might be maintaining records of dependents if you've got some kind of relocation function, uh, it could be information about uh, personal information and health information, potentially health information about the employee and employee's dependents if you're operating a um, health insurance scheme, all those kind of things. All of those uh, I see as being different processing activities and I would expect to see those addressed individually uh, in the employee privacy statement, remembering that if you go back to this definition that we talked about, uh, Article 7.2 refers to consent being specific and distinguishable and I think logically the only way that you could get um, specific and distinguishable consent in all in relation to all the different processing activities would be if they um, <clears throat> if they're all set out on the form uh, and the employee consents to them all uh, or some of them individually and remembering also that um, the new definition of consent talks about it being unambiguous. I think that has to mean um, that there needs to be some kind of positive action on the part of the employee uh, and the employee or data subject to indicate their consent. Uh, and um, I know I did speak to a, a client recently who was bemoaning the fact that um, they felt that everybody who talked to them about GDPR was demonstrating a tick box mentality was the phrase that they've used and I do fully understand and sympathize with them and that's not very attractive I guess all of that but I think in relation to these type of employee privacy statements I can see quite a strong argument um, for the use of individual uh, boxes that an employee would tick next to a statement that says you know you consent to us using your personal data for our payroll processing or bank transfer or whatever it is and they would tick to confirm that they are consenting to that. So I expect that um, employee privacy statements will evolve to take that kind of shape. I would also suggest that in those you set out uh, how long you're planning to keep people's personal data for after the termination of the employment relationship because um, 
the GDPR also says broadly that you shouldn't continue to process personal data um, beyond the time where the activity to which the data subject consented has ceased to occur. So if the data subject is consenting to you using their personal data for the purpose of their employment and their employment ends, on the face of it, your processing of their personal data should also end there. So I think if you're planning to retain data beyond that, you need to be saying so. Uh, also, just factor in and give some thought to this issue of withdrawal of revocation of consent, because I could foresee circumstances where this might become a tactical response. Uh, for example, if the relationship between the employer and employee breaks down, I wouldn't be surprised if some, some employees didn't simply just fire off an email saying, well, you know, I'm withdrawing my consent to you processing my personal data. And any business that's relying upon consent as a basis for processing may find that they simply can't respond quickly enough to the withdrawal of consent. Uh, and that would inevitably mean that if they carried on processing beyond the point of withdrawal, they would be in breach of the legislation unless they have a fallback option of a different processing condition. So we're back to that potentially compliance with the contract point that I identified earlier. As I mentioned earlier, I can also foresee an impact of uh, for GDPR on recruitment, remembering that recruit recruitment is one of those exercises where most organizations get a vast amount of personal data um, sent to them by um, potential employees. And that may come in within a, a controlled environment around a formal recruitment process, which perhaps is uh, not such a great risk in that um, it's uh, perfectly straightforward to anticipate the receipt of significant quanti quantities of personal data. Where I can foresee that it may become more of an issue is that um, I know, um, and many of you will clearly have far greater experience of this than me, that organisations get applications from um, interested uh, candidates on SPAC or from recruitment consultants sending CVs on SPAC that just come into somebody's email um, inbox. And where that happens, there would be a situation where the organization would be receiving personal data uh, and potentially not be aware of it. So I think um, it might be worth investing some time in thinking about how that is going to be managed. And it may be that your conclusion is going to be that you don't, as an organization, you don't want to receive personal data in that way. Uh, and I have no doubt that you can take steps to prevent people supplying their personal data to you um, on spec in that manner. Um, also worth mentioning um, something that I come across infrequently but tends to be fairly significant where I come across it and this is um, undertaking checks or, or research about um, candidates to join an organization and I've seen that operate in a number of different ways most recently in a financial organization, I've seen that take the shape of uh, criminal records checks. Uh, but in other organizations, I've seen a, a less um, structured and less sophisticated method of checking where people just simply um, review social media posting for candidates. Um, and what I would say in relation to those is that both of those mechanisms really, it's very difficult to foresee how that level of intrusive um, examination of people's personal data could be um, compliant with the GDPR. Uh, theoretically, I guess it would be compliant if the data subject um, consented, but what you cannot do is um, make consent a condition of the contract. So you can't say to a data subject, uh, we'll only um, accept or process your application for this role if you consent to undertake these these uh, under, consent was undertaking these checks. There there will be exceptions for particular roles that require a criminal records check um, 
for professional purposes, for, for example, teaching, etc. But I think um, that will not be a live issue for for um, potential employers because holding the relevant professional um, qualification for the particular year, um, I think, addresses the criminal records check issue. It's difficult to foresee that um, it would be reasonable to recheck that in circumstances where somebody's already qualified as a teacher, or whatever the qualification is. So just be aware of that with that kind of level of checking. Um, where it can uh, be very invasive of people's privacy, that that's uh, likely to be a major consideration under GDPR. I've also highlighted in, in this uh, presentation that I can see some issues developing for a particular new category of employees that won't, won't have existed prior to the GDPR, and these are data protection officers. Um, under the new legislation, it says that certain uh, organizations are required to appoint a DPO, uh, public authorities or um, organizations that are undertaking systematic large-scale uh, monitoring or processing of um, personal data. Interestingly, um, you might think straight away, well, you know, I'm not involved with the public authority, so that's not going to catch me. Uh, and I can understand that, that view. All that I would say is if you look at this third provision, um, which suggests that um, a DPO will be necessary uh, if an organization carries out large-scale processing of special categories of data. I suspect that any organization which has a large unionized workforce, which operates a payroll function in which union subs are deducted um, at source, so in order to do that, typically, payroll need to know uh, which employees are union members and which are not union members. What I think will go on there is large-scale processing of a special uh, category of data, and that's trade union membership. So it could be arguable, I think, that employers that fall into that category may also be obliged to appoint a DPO. And in fact, um, uh, an organization can elect voluntarily to appoint a DPO and I can imagine that a lot of organizations will just take the view that it might be helpful to concentrate all these kind of new uh, data protection regulatory issues in the hands of one individual um, and, and they may take the view that they want to appoint somebody to do that and where that happens where a DPO is appointed it's important to understand that the GDPR will impose obligations upon the DPO, requiring them to work in a particular way, report to the highest levels of management in the organization, requiring them to report um, breaches, compliance issues to the ICO. Uh, and the GDPR goes on to say that if the DPO carries out those obligations, they should not be um, penalised by their employers for undertaking those obligations. And I think that creates a bit of an unusual dynamic um, in the relationship between an employer and, an, uh, and a DPO in that I'm not saying that a DPO is going to become somebody who is unsackable, but I can foresee a, scenarios where it may become problematic to try and uh, discipline a DPO uh, because they may simply respond to disciplinary action by arguing that they're being penalized for carrying out their functions. So that's going to require some very careful management um, by HR professionals if that situation arises and also beforehand to um, monitor and manage the relationship between the DPO and their direct management line so that everybody understands that um, slightly unusual uh, employer-employee relationship. I also quickly wanted to talk about the obligation to self-report which is created under the GDPR. Uh, this is a provision that requires organisations to report significant data breaches to the uh, ICO, the UK regulator in relation to data protection, um, once they're aware of them. Uh, and it's said that this time period should be within 72 hours of data knowledge. This has an interesting impact to my mind because in order to report within 72 hours, the business 
must ensure that there's no significant time delay between um, the knowledge of the data breach um, happening, that, that knowledge being gained, bearing in mind that that might happen at quite an operational level, uh, and the transmission of that knowledge to the relevant person, potentially at a, a different management level within the organization, who would be reporting that to the ICO. So that information has got to move really quickly um, from wherever the data breach happens, where it's found, to the relevant person who has the responsibility for reporting to the ICO. And if that doesn't happen, or for example, in circumstances where an employee tries to cover up a data breach, perhaps where they think they've been culpable in some way, then that potentially creates a problem for the business because they would be deemed to be uh, ha have knowledge uh, and they would fail in their obligation to report. So I think that must mean that um, in order to mitigate the risk of enforcement action on the back of this, it's going to be very important for organisations to roll out training for all employees to ensure, to ensure that they understand the obligation to uh, report as soon as possible. And I think if an organisation wants to be in the best possible position to argue that they've done everything they could possibly do to ensure that employees knew that they were required to report a data breach and for some strange reason a particular employee went off on a frolic of their own and decided to try and cover a data breach up. I can conceive that that might offer the organisation a defence in relation to enforcement action by the ICO. But I think in order to support that defence, the organisation will have to say to the ICO, in effect, we've done everything we could reasonably have done to communicate to employees the importance that we attach to the privacy of personal data and the significance of a data breach. And that must mean that they've, they've got the relevant policies in place that tell employees this, that they've reinforced that with training. And also, I think that they've backed this up with a disciplinary sanction. Um, and I would anticipate that this would be um, a sanction that falls into the category of gross misconduct. Because if you're going to say to employees, we regard the um, privacy of personal data as being a top priority, then I think where an employee has deliberately breached your policies in respect of that, you should be anticipating that the response to that breach would also fall into the most serious categories. So um, I think that needs to be considered as a potential addition to the list of gross misconduct offences that your organisation might want to uh, put in place. And the reason that I've identified Morrisons here is because many of you will be familiar with the uh, litigation involving as a group class action pursued on behalf of a number of employees and former employees of Morrisons, which had a preliminary hearing just before Christmas. Uh, and what happened in the case of Morrisons was one of their disaffected payroll employees about four years ago uh, maliciously released a lot of personal data relating to uh, Morrison's employees into the public domain. He was uh, subject to criminal prosecution and I think got uh, eight years um, imprisonment and Morrison's have now uh, been subject to a class action by the employees who say that they've suffered distress as a consequence of the release of their personal data. And um, Morrison's uh, attempted to have the claim struck out, but at a, on the basis that there wasn't any fault on their part, and this was a malicious act by a disaffected employee uh, acting on his own. And uh, at a hearing before Christmas, the judge held that that wasn't sufficient to allow Morrison's to escape liability and that they were... Uh, they were vicariously liable for the actions of a malicious employee. So this whole issue about the way that you control the behaviour of employees in relation to personal data is going to become much more significant. And what Morrisons have already found is that I understand they've already spent about £2 million in defending this claim. And uh, I think there's over there's certainly over 1,000 employees in the class action. So it's potentially fairly significant exposure for them going forward. So if you want to avoid that, um, you need to be thinking about the way that you control the behaviour of your employees in relation to privacy of personal data.
So, finally, by way of conclusion, I think it's important that businesses don't panic in response to the GDPR. I don't believe that there is a silver bullet solution that can be bought in a packet that's going to take all of these issues away at the drop of a hat. For years, people have been asking me to draft them a policy which deals with all of their data protection issues um, and they can and they believe that that simply is something that they can cross off their to-do list. I don't think the GDPR will be soluble in that way. I think it's a much more holistic uh, situation. I think it's also a truism that businesses that are most compliant with the present regime will find the step on to compliance with GDPR will be less of a um, challenge than those businesses which are less compliant under the present regime. Um, I think if you have good compliance systems now, you should be able to upgrade those in a relatively straightforward um, manner. And I would also recommend that this is really where you should be focusing on the processing conditions and consent issue. I think this is where most of the interest for HR practitioners will um, crystallize over the next few months. And hopefully, uh, the information that I've set out earlier in the webinar will allow you to give this some further thought in the context of your organisation and, and form your own views on compliance strategies. If you have any questions that you'd like to put to me or there's any follow-up queries, please get in touch and I'll be happy to address those in due course. Otherwise, I'm very grateful for your attendance and I hope that that's been helpful and interesting for you. Thanks very much.